best. You've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show. The preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready. Get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the ChrisVossShow.com. The ChrisVossShow.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to take in the give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification so you can see all the wonderful books, reviews, interviews that we're doing on the Chris Voss Show. You got all of the different groups on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all that sort of good stuff. You can find me and the Chris Voss Show everywhere as well. Today, we have a most excellent book author. She's a novelist and she's written quite a few books. We'll get into it here in a second. But she's got a new book out called Good neighbors sarah langan and sarah's got her book out uh, i think it came out in uh, february she is award-winning novelist and screenwriter her most recent novel the one we just mentioned good neighbors was a b and n book of the month selection an amazon reader's choice a apple must listen and got raves from ew people newsweek aarp and the ala and according to Gabino Iglesias at NPR, it's one of the most creepiest, nerving deconstructions of American suburbia I've ever read. So I, we just either scared everyone off or we really lit up some people that are like, I like this type of book. <laughs> there you go. Her novella, You Have the Prettiest Mask, is out now from the L.C. RW via Small Beer Press, and her short story, Night Nurse, is also now out in Best Horror of the Year, Volume 12. She's won three Bram Stoker Awards, and her previous novels are The Keeper, The Missing, and Audrey's Door. She has an MFA from the Columbia University, unlike mine from MF from uh, the streets, <laughs> and MS in Environmental Toxicity from NYU. She's a founding board member of the Shirley Jackson Award and lives in Los Angeles with her husband and the writer-director, J.T. Petty. They're two daughters and a manic rabbit. She's delighted to be here. Sarah, are you sure? Are you delighted to be here? I am. I am. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And congr <laughs> congratulations on your book. I like how the bio says, she's delighted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny well, it's always true right <laughs> yeah and what's really wild is a bit of a sidebar here you've sent you send me your bio and there's a pr picture here where you're wearing a shirt that says they live we sleep well can i ask what that's about because yeah, you know, yeah, the hair is standing on the back of my head that's the john carpenter movie they oh, live oh, right wow. are you and, a big john um, carpenter fan yeah, I'm a huge Carpenter fan. There you I go. love his stuff. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Who <laughs> knew that you would like horror? I went to one of his concerts. Like, he's crazy. He's amazing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you've written this book and uh, published it out and all that good stuff. Give us your plugs where people can find you on the interwebs and learn more about you and order the book as well. That would be great. My website is www.sarahlangan.com, S-A-R-A-H-L-A-N-G-A-N. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Instagram. Nice. And you've got a lot of great, you've got a lot of great exciting reviews that have come up. It was named by Goodreads as one of the most anticipated mysteries and thrillers of 2021. Tell us what motivated you to write this book. You've written, how many total books have you written? I've written five, published four. There you go. There you go. So is the fifth one that's going to be coming in the future or? No, but happily, I just signed a deal for my sixth book um, ah, through Simon & Schuster. There you go. Congratulations. I'm super excited about it. It happened last week. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank uh, you. So tell us the arcing overview or what I think maybe I need to go back. What motivated you want to write this book then? So I started a long time ago. I was writing straight horror at the time and I had the story I wanted to write about how people's relationships can fall apart and how mobs work. And 
I was using a monster as the impetus for the fighting that happens between the neighbors on this cul-de-sac. On, and it was based on the Monsters of Maple Street, that Twilight Zone episode, the monsters oh. they do on Maple Street. And I couldn't make it work, so I put it aside. And then the last four years, I went back to it because I'd written another book that didn't sell. And I was like, maybe I need to change things up and figure something out. So I went back to it and I realized that the problem was the monster. And I was trying to tell a very human story. And so once I removed the monster and looked at people and the way that they act, that was the story. And it's not cynical. Like my worldview isn't that people are bad. It's that we can plug into each other in catastrophic ways in which we lose all rational sense. And I think that's really what's happened to us the last four years. Yeah. Longer, it's been building for a long time. So that was the impetus. That was like what I was thinking about and the kind of story I was trying to tell. But then it's also about the way that suburbia works and the way that moms have these identities forced onto them that mm. they find pretty lonely. And mm. as a mom myself, I was surprised by it because I, 10 years ago or 11 years ago, I was on book tours and doing different things. And then when I had kids, suddenly everyone was like, you're not allowed to be that anymore. You have to be this mm -hmm. and you have to be good at it, even if you don't know how. And so yeah, it's terrible. You're like, oh my God, this is so much pressure. So it's about that too. And it's about, there's this one male character in the story who has, I think for a man, the worst thing happened to him, which is he's falsely accused of abuse, of abusing mm. a child. Mm. So it's a lot of those sort of, and I think that's a thing that would make any neighborhood go wild is thinking that there's a man on the block who does things to children. So they go crazy in ways that I think really reflect what's been happening in our, our culture, be it on Facebook or be it, be it in, in protests. I think this is a great premise for the book because when I was growing up, we had neighborhoods like that. There was always the neighborhood that would whisper about the, the one divorced lady on the street. Of course, now it's flipped and there's just the one married person yeah. on the street. But there, there was all the whispering, gossiping and all that sort of stuff. Your mom would always be like, there's the one neighbor and the one neighbor is, I don't know, whatever. That's one neighbor you never hit up for sugar, at least back in those days. You know? <laughs> I think we were the weird family. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, were you? I think so. I think we were okay because people would ask us for sugar and salt every now and then. It was a weird. Nobody does that anymore. They never knock on your door and they go, "Hey, man, do you? Could I get a cup of salt from you?" It's funny. Yeah, yeah, I do it once in a while in my neighborhood, but I'm probably yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think I I remember growing up in the burbs, and I remember everyone kind of knew what everyone else was doing and what everyone's job was, and how much their parents made and where they were, what their the kids' grades were and what their reputations were. And it's all such still, silly, narcissistic things to care about. So That's interesting. Wasn't there a movie called The Burbs or something? It's where it's with Tom Hanks and the, there's the creepy people that move in to the neighborhood. Is that a hey, I vaguely remember that, but I didn't see uh, it. Who's the monster in this, in this uh, story? It's a couple of factors coming together. But I have one character who is so injured and carrying so many different identities that she can't parse that she's gone insane. She's gone a little out of her mind. And she's the one who has the most perfect mask and is trying to, to, to make everyone think she's the most ideal human. And she's the one who instigates and helps spread this rumor. And she's the one who is doing the most harm with him in her own home, which I think is pretty accurate for how people act. You, those are exactly the kinds of people who want to throw attention away from what they're doing by accusing other people or pick, taking leadership roles. So I studied narcissism pretty deeply because it's she's a classic narcissist. Yeah. And it's we a really kinda... interesting psychological state, narcissism. So... I think we're all forced to study malignant narcissism the last four or five years, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep the professionals in it. But yeah, you're right. Human nature has a very ugly way in that facility where people look at it. Sometimes the people that are trying the hardest 
to be put off to put off the perfect uh, image, especially at the local uh, the soccer mom sort of thing, and what's the competition of the, the just the all that local mom stuff. And there's a competitive nature to it that's sometimes quite evil, where everyone's got to uh, keep up with the Joneses, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always surprised by it. It's, it always shocks me because I, I just don't think I'm wired to notice what other people are doing. <laughs> yeah. So when yeah. people do, they're like, have you seen this on this neighborhood? Did you see this guy? He walks around the block too many times. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But it's a common thing. And I think it's the deeper the wound, the more they're trying to d- distract themselves from it. And the more I... I tend to have sympathy for those people. The more I learned about narcissism and attachment disorders, the more sympathetic I got to these people because there is almost always some voice inside their head screaming they're not good enough. And they're just like dancing like hysterical puppets trying to get away from that. And sure, they're going to be illogical because this voice is screaming. And if you trigger them in any way, that's what's happening. It's yeah. not that they're looking at you and fighting with you. This book is so much about how people fight with ghosts. Is there a bit of good intention that paves the way to hell with some of the other neighbors? Yeah, I think there is. I think what happens is the sinkhole forms because it's also a climate fiction book and half the neighbors leave because it's not safe to stay. So oh, the wow. people who do stay aren't making great decisions to begin with. And they feel very sorry for the problematic character because her daughter's gone missing down a sinkhole. So there's, oh. their sympathy is with her. Mm. And then she harnesses that sympathy and says, but I think it was this family, this newcomer family that doesn't fit in and seems strange. Mm. And the dad's got tattoos and smokes cigarettes in public. And the mom's this ex-beauty queen who wears really tight clothes. And they're from God, they have Brooklyn accents. It's horrible. Oh, clearly. So, yeah. <laughs> it's always those Brooklyn accents and, mm-hmm. and the tattoos. So is, this, is there just one sinkhole? Does a sinkhole end up being like a metaphor in the story or some sort of uh, implication? Yeah, yeah. So the sinkhole, there's just one, but it's very much, it's set just a few years into the future. Mm-hmm. But I have a degree in environmental toxicology. So mm-hmm. I study global warming and I studied thermodynamics dynamics and things are happening as at an accelerated rate. So even though it's just 2027, it's near future, uh, more sinkholes will form. That's, that's just part of global warming. Increased temperatures mean increased erosion. But there's, it was a symbol for more everything. There's just more strain on people because how are you supposed to get your, keep your job and keep going to your job when there's a fire and you, you have to take your family away for a month or you don't? There's just, we're going to have more immigration because- there are people literally starving. They're, we're going to have more shortages and crop failures. This is just how it's going to be. So this suburb has much more pressure on it. And I was trying to illustrate that with the sinkhole and with their behaviors, because they know that the future isn't better than the past. Mm. And they're very worried for their children. And the sinkhole is literally eating their children. Wow. Wow. That's got to be wild. And is it getting bigger or is it just staying yep. the same? And, and, and so it's so they're, they, they have this thing coming down upon them, much like a horror stalking thing stalking you. And they're trying to they're dealing with all this uh, human nature stuff. But then they have an environment that's we're coming for you slowly, but surely. And but they pick a scapegoat, which is, I think, what we do. As, mm-hmm. as we look at the country and what we're doing right now, we could we could be fixing these problems, but we're doing a lot of shouting each other at each other. So it's a little bit about that too. And the, so when the girl falls down the sinkhole, the rescue teams and the ex- excavation crew has to come and they have to make it much bigger as they look for her. Oh. And, and then the sinkhole is full of bitumen, like tar sand, which mm-hmm. is sticky and black and they track it all over the neighborhood. So this entire park is just full of this tar sand and she prints that get into people's houses and things as the novel progresses Mm. and is it does it have an effect on how much more toxic they become is it correlated uh no i don't talk about toxicity at all i but Mm. they're afraid it is just Mm. as we're unclear on much of what we're being exposed to right now that and what the future holds yeah yeah it's pretty interesting what 
Have all your books been about horror? I should ask for our audience. No. So this third book is not horror. This fourth book, Good Neighbors, is definitely not horror. There's nothing supernatural. And as you read it, you're not frightened. You're just rooting for these people and annoyed and then pissed off at the people who are making it hard for them. So it's very much just a human thriller. Uh, The previous novels were definitely horror. They had monsters in them or ghosts or something like that. And then my other stuff has been science fiction. It's been fantasy. It's been horror. It's been mainstream literature. So what made you, uh, this is more, I guess I'm looking at the thing. I was reading a bunch of the different reviews and best mystery, thriller, and suspense editors pick, in fact, with uh, Amazon. What made you decide to maybe do less horror and go with the thriller and suspense? It was more about the story I wanted to tell and the most effective way to do it. And I think this is the most effective way because if I had a monster come in, it would have really abnegated responsibility that the characters had for their own actions. Because once you throw a monster in there, things become less believable. It's more fun in some ways, but it's less realistic and believable. And I think what I really wanted to show was that these characters, nothing was forcing them to make the decisions that they make. Sometimes the biggest monsters are human nature and ourselves. I've often said people are like, we need world peace. I'm like, if you want world peace, call the humans because that we're the problem. <laughs> the monsters are due on Maple Street. It's this Twilight Zone episode that I was really thinking about a lot where the power goes out on Maple Street, which is this suburban block and everyone comes outside and it's 1950s McCarthyism is what he's addressing. Ah. And the, they don't understand what's happening. And a young kid comes up and says, I read science fiction. And what this is, it's aliens coming and they're ready to attack. And they've already been here. They've probably been here for years. It's probably some couple on this block Mm. and they're in disguise and now they're going to take over. And everyone laughs the kid off. But as the night wears on, it gets more creepy for them as lights go on and lights go off and cars turn on and cars turn off and they become a mob this neighborhood and they wind up shooting an innocent man because they're convinced aliens are among them and then they pan out and you get to the actual aliens who look just like regular people at the top of the hill who are like this is how you kill humanity you get them to turn on each other because this, there's, this is every town has, every town has a, a Maple Street. And there's, we go from one Maple Street to the next, to the next, to the next. And this is how it ends. And the aliens are just letting them kill each other. Yeah. You just, they're like, we j- just turn off the lights. They will freak out. They'll kill each other. They'll lose their shit just by turning off the power. Sounds like every, uh, just about, I think in the 70s, there were some major power outages that people started killing each other and going full purge. It seemed, and I think one was over a chipmunk. Half the country went down over a chipmunk or something or a squirrel. But no, that's, uh, you made my hair on the back of my neck race with that thing i'm sitting here looking at i pulled it up as you mentioned it but yeah it's really interesting i think putin's doing the same thing with us here and he's like yeah we just seeded a little bit with some whatever they'll turn against each other and we don't even have to bomb them they'll just no we'll fight over we will fight over anything yeah, to tears over... and hysteria bringing yeah. up problems that happened in our past yeah. <laughs> we're like... fighting over dr seuss books that no one buys yeah yeah, let's spend days on this. Meanwhile, yeah. no one's voted in a local election for 50 years. Pretty much, yeah. That's the, okay. Democracy, is that a thing? Yeah. Um, How does it yeah. work? I don't know for that. Yeah, I was supposed to vote. So yeah, it's that's really interesting. I'm gonna, you've got me going now too. On top of reading the book, I've got to go watch the uh, Twilight Zone thing because it's really interesting. There's probably a lot of different stories you can get from that Twilight Zone. In fact, uh, is that Andy Griffith that I see there? Yeah. The picture? There you go. (laughs) I think it is. I can't. But he was also in Face in the Crowd, which is one of my favorite movies. It's amazing. I think it's, it might might be Andy Griffith or it might be a guy who is. A guy who looks like Andy Griffith. A doppelganger. It looks like it might be an extra guy, but, or it might be a doppelganger of Andy Griffith because this guy looks a little short. But anyway, what other aspects of the book haven't we talked about? I think the. I've been getting a little cerebral, but I think the take home is it's a really, the reason it's getting these reviews is people can't put it down because it's, it's also a bit of a soap opera page turner where it's uh. like, what? This, this family from Brooklyn is having such a hard time. And then a daughter fell down a sinkhole and what happened to her and where's she going to go? And, and there's a lot of fun intrigue and stuff that's just pleasant to read. 
and you just want to keep turning the pages because you're like, what happens next? I yeah. I love those books. You just burn through them and you're just like, oh my gosh, I got to find out. You'll, you've left me with so much. What techniques do you do to write books like this and, and write in such a way that makes people want to turn the pages? I study it. I, I look at things, books that I found, like I read Carrie twice while I was writing this because I was like, how did he do it? How did he make such a short page turner? Because I like a short book, which Good Neighbors is. And I think if you can get it succinct, if you can cut half of it, do it. Just make it as as quick and fun as you can. And then I also, anything that I find that's remotely boring or explanatory or something I want to say that doesn't quite fit in the plot, I just cut. So you just cut kind of some of the extras and distractions and just go right for the Well, you, You hope that everything you're trying to say is there already. You know, with the plot that I picked and the characters that I picked and what happens, that ought to be enough. Mm -hmm. I don't, I shouldn't have to say anything more. There you go. Do you see this becoming a movie? It sounds like it might be a really interesting movie. I've written the pilot and there's a lot of movement and there. Mm -hmm. So I'm pitching it with the people who are attached in a couple of months, which would be really exciting for a TV show. I think what's interesting about this movie is there's a real self-identity here because I watched it growing up with my mom in the neighborhood ladies and everyone has that one neighbor that they're always watching what's that neighbor doing over there there's always that going on in in these suburban neighborhoods there's always that one neighbor and what he's up to or sometimes if you're lucky you have two but i had somebody down the block that my best friend when i was four told me was the haunted house so i would yeah. like run past it and hold my breath and i was 30 and i was still like that's the haunted house and a girl from high school wrote to me and was like do you still live in that house and i was like yeah and she and then she told me that she lived in the house the haunted house <laughs> and i pictured like an old witch i was like oh my god you lived in that house and also how did i not know that <laughs> <laughs> when did you get the demons exercised from yourself <laughs> The, that reminds me, I was watching TikTok the other day, and there's a guy on there who's, I believe, a Catholic priest. He's a priest of some type, and he's he exercises demons. So I guess on TikTok, he's he's co- making commentary of, of his experience of exorcisms, and it's pretty interesting. It's, yeah, I'm serious. It, I was wa- I was flipping through TikTok one night trying to go to sleep, which is a bad idea because you're just always like, one more TikTok, one more TikTok. <laughs> And then 4 a.m. girls around, you're just like, holy shit. And there is a guy on there who's a, a, I think he's fairly new, but he's got quite a few videos. But like he he basically will take other people's videos and do a duet, they call it. And, and then sometimes he just talks about exorcisms. I think he's done like 100 exorcisms. And so I'll talk about demonic possession and all that stuff that happened to me as a child clearly compels you. Yeah, the um, nuns told us that was possible when I was growing up, and I was so freaked out. I would, like, look under the bed. <laughs> Is it there? Is it going to get me? It's like the, the neighborhood thing. If you're not the one watching the other neighbors on the street... The person everyone's watching is you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can't find the monster, mm, trick in the mirror, I don't know. I don't know. What that <laughs> <laughs> so this is pretty good. Riveting portrayal, riveting and ruthless portrayal of American suburbia excavates the perils and betrayals of motherhood, friendships, and dangerous clash between society or social hierarchy, childhood trauma, and fear. Is it something that men are also going to get into, or is it is it oh, more? Oh yeah, for- no. A lot of men like it's it's a guy's worst nightmare, and it's so fun to read. You know, <laughs> this, like this sounds like a bunch of husbands that are just like, oh, fuck. guys, we want men and we want dads to do the job, and we want them to be picking up the slack. But in the tr- we make it hard for them, and I don't, but. It's they don't get included on the email list. They're viewed with suspicion if they're hosting the playdates. Mm. There's so much that they they can't do just because they're men. It's like they're viewed as having some kind of original sin. And I I know plenty of moms who won't have playdates with dads. They're like, oh, it's weird. I don't want to. So I think that's a really <laughs> ridiculous position for a man to be in. And it's about that too. And listen, it's a page turner. So guys will like it. There you go. There you go. Well, this sounds like an exciting book. One of the most anticipated mysteries and thrillers of 2021, named by Goodreads. And we'll look forward to your other book that's coming out. Sarah, anything you want to give us uh, on the book and party? I hope you enjoy it. It's a good book. There you go. Check it out. (laughs) She's written several, so she knows what she's doing. And I think it's pretty interesting. I still have to go watch that Twilight thing after this and then get to the book. So, Sarah, thank you for uh, spending some time with us on the show, being with us and sharing your wonderful knowledge. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. Give us your plugs if you could one more time. SarahLangan.com. That's S-A-R-A-H-L-A-N-G-A-N.com. And then I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There you go, guys. Follow up with her. I, I think you're going to end up writing a lot of books at the pace you're going. You should be pretty good there. I hope. There you I go. love writing. <laughs> as long as they let me. There you go. So, guys, be sure to check it out. Go to Amazon.com or your local bookseller. Support those folks. They need all the help they can get with the coronavirus. Good Neighbors, a novel. And uh, you can pick that baby up. Go to YouTube.com to see the video version of this uh, interview. You can also go to Goodreads.com for slash Chris Voss. See us on all our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and all that good stuff, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Wear your mask and stay safe. And we'll see you.